If you want to change a generation of software engineers, you need to change the mindset of their leaders and it needs to start earlier. And the obvious answer for that is to include green software as part of our university courses. Hello and welcome to Environment Variables, brought to you by the Green Software Foundation. In each episode, we discuss the latest news and events surrounding green software. On our show, you can expect candid conversations with top experts in their field who have a passion for how to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions of software. I'm your host, Chris Adams. Welcome to Environment Variables. My name's Chris Adams, and on this episode, I am joined by Sarah Bergman of Microsoft and Luis Cruz of TU Delft, that's Technical University of Delft. We'll be talking about how people teach and learn to make green software. Before we dive in though, maybe it's time for a quick round of introductions. My name is Chris Adams. I am the chair of the Green Software Foundation Policy Group, and I'm also the executive director of the Green Web Foundation, where we work towards an entirely fossil-free internet by 2030. Luis, would you be so kind as to introduce yourself? Then we'll give Sarah a chance to explain, introduce herself and see what she, um, and what she does. Sure thing. Hello, everyone. My name is Luis Cruz, and I'm an assistant professor at the software engineering group at TU Delft. And there we do research and educate the next generation of software developers. And our main topics revolve around software testing, software debugging, and of course, also about green software, how to build energy efficient software. So most of my time is devoted on doing research on green software, green AI, sustainable software engineering, and of course also about educating, and finally about managing, because when we have a lot of people, we also have to manage people, and students are also part of this managing and uh, management load that we have at universities. Back to you, Chris. Thanks, Luis. And uh, Sarah, one of our recurring hosts. Why don't you introduce yourself for some of the folks who may not have heard the previous episodes? Great, thanks. And it's always great to be back on the podcast. My name is Sarah Bergman. I am a software engineer at Microsoft, where I work in M365 or with M365 products. And in the Green Software Foundation, I'm the chair of the Writers Project, where we deal with some of our written materials, like the articles we produce and the newsletter that you're all hopefully subscribed to. Okay, thank you, Sarah. And just for the record, while you brought that up, if someone did want to subscribe to the newsletter and find out about this through regular and timely updates, where would they be going to find out such a thing? You go to our website, greensoftware.foundation, and it should be like right in your face. Okay, awesome. I think even I could follow that, actually. (laughs) Okay, so today we're talking about basically teaching, teaching green software, because if we're going to be helping people figure out how to make more planet-friendly applications, then it probably helps to know what's going on in the world of teaching software and see where, where people are learning this stuff. And this is partly why, Luis, it's kind of, I'm glad to have you on for this because we actually met through things like the climateaction.tech Slack group. But one thing that was I found really exciting from some of the work you did was the fact that you were working on an entirely open syllabus for sustainable software engineering. And uh, obviously, lots of us like open source and open an open culture. But I figured it might be worth just t- maybe you telling us a little bit about why the cor- why you made the course and why you chose to make it open. Yeah, that's a very good question, Chris. And uh, so maybe let me get back a little bit and tell you how how did all this started. Yeah? So it started by the fact that I was doing research in green software way uh, before teaching sustainable software engineering. And the always the main motivation point was the fact that software engineers are eager to build more energy efficient software, but they often lack the resources or they often don't know exactly how to do it. But they, they are highly motivated to do it. So they keep asking about what are the best practices, how can we test energy efficiency, these sort of things. So, so that was my main motivation to start this line of research. But then, of course, I started realizing, okay, 
I should not only be doing research in my office, right? I should also try to communicate this back to developers. And that was when I realized that, in fact, it's not only about building or creating writing papers, but also about communicate them back to the community. When, and when you Google about it or when you look at the web for resources about this, you almost don't see anything about it. And then if you look at the conversations that we have about climate action, how to change our software industry into a more sustainable industry, it always revolves around new policies, right? How to make sure that the industry is complying with sustainable practices, how to make sure that we can ask our suppliers for energy efficient certificates, these sort of things. But sometimes you forget that if you want to change our society, the strongest weapon we have is education, right? If you want to change a generation of software engineers of the software industry, you need to change the mindset of their leaders and it need to start earlier. And to me, the obvious answer for that is to include green software as part of our university courses, because that's how you change the mindset of the future leaders in the next generation of software engineering. But again, when I started, when I realized this, I started looking for content at, in my university. Okay, who is teaching these kind of topics? And I realized that there was a lot of content around sustainability at UDELFT, but they kind of miss the, the fact that software also has an impact on sustainability. So if you build a software system, this software system will probably have a carbon impact. And somehow I feel that the other fields kind of miss this point because they tend to target sustainable problems by creating a new AI model, creating a new software system that will automate something and help them improve the sustainability of their problems. And they kind of forget that if you run something in the server, that server will probably be spending energy. So going back to the to this pursuit of sustainability topics at university, I realized that the computer science courses have nothing to do about this. And the funny thing is that if you think about green software, you will see that it, it, it covers or it touches upon different topics of computer science, testing, debug programming languages, even in software engineering, the way you, the software development life cycle. If you look at all the stages, every single stage should have a perspective on sustainability if you really want to make sustainable software. So in a way, the fact that none of these courses in computer science have a single chapter that would cover energy efficiency or sustainability was somehow a, a trigger for me and more motivation for me to think, okay, we really need to start creating content. And at TU Delft, they were very open when I started pitching about a, a new course idea. They thought, okay, this is really something that aligns with our values. So, so they gave me all the freedom to start designing the course and creating the course. And I'm really happy that in this first edition, we had around 20, 20 something students that were really enthusiastic about the topic. And they knew nothing about it because, as I said, there was nothing around this. And, and they were already fourth year master students. So after four years of education, they, they were not exposed to this. To me, the fact that it was so challenging to find content to help me design the course, I think it was clear to me that I would, if I wanted to change our community, I would have to deliver this content and everyone can use it and reuse it and learn from it because that's the way that we can make a second edition of this course or someone else can make an improved edition of a sustainable software engineering course. And that's the main goal. So this, this is not about getting a recognition. This is about changing society. And, and I think the best thing we can do to change society is to make this content open. Cool. 
So I have a couple of questions, but before I come in on that, I just want to see, Sarah, is there anything that you want to kind of come in on there before I come in with my questions on this one? This is where I wish the podcast was like a video recording because you would have seen me nodding vigorously throughout the entire thing. Yeah, there's so much of this that resonates very deeply with me. And, and I was lucky enough to be one, like not, not one of your students, but when I was a student a few years ago in, in Sweden, we did have a course called Green IT, led by an amazing professor called uh, Simin Nadjam Teherani, uh, who basically, she, uh, like her, the whole course was based on reading research papers. So it was like, she has been a researcher in this field for a long time about energy efficiency. And she was basically like, don't just take my word for it, take all of these other researchers' word for it. And it really opened my eyes a lot. And I know it changed other people's mindset who took the course. And that was the one course that made me want to pursue this more. So it's such a powerful tool. And yeah, just a big plus one, I guess. Cool. All right. Well, Lewis, when students are actually taking this course, were there some parts of introducing a sustainability element that seemed to work particularly easily? Or were there some parts that they particularly struggled with? Because... What I've learned is that some things can be a little bit counterintuitive. And yeah, I'd be, I'm really curious because I've never heard from someone who's actually teaching, you know, undergrads or, or even postgraduates for them to kind of pick up some of these skills that are obviously going to be in demand in the future. Yeah, that is a very, very good question. So one important part of the course is about measuring energy consumption of a software application. Yeah? And I don't want to be uh, boring or anything, but of course... When you have to measure, you need a metric, right? You need to measure a particular metric. And this metric needs to be uh, clear enough for the person that is analyzing the data. Yeah? So to make it more precise, when you're measuring energy efficiency, probably you're going to look into energy consumption. But you also have more metrics. You also have the power consumption, right? And, and power can be the average power over the execution of a particular software, but it can also be the instant power that is being uh, uh, used by the, by the CPUs, by the memory, by the whole laptop system. So this is the most issue. So what should I be analyzing, energy or power? And depending on the use case, you should be looking at one or another. But then, of course, you need to make sense out of it. So if your software is wasting 20 joules after two minutes, I mean, what does it mean? Is it energy efficient or is it like energy inefficient? Should I do something about it? Should I just assume that it's fine? And this kind of thing requires quite some discussion most of the time because every single problem is different. Every, every software, every programming language will have different thresholds. And I won't have a clear answer. Like I, I always don't have all the answers for every single result we get. But one of the cool things about having this course is that then we use that as an opportunity for discussion during the class. And this works quite well when you have around 20, 30 people in the same room, because if it's more than that, it's a bit difficult. Sometimes it happens to have really large classes. But when you have a small group, they will come up with the most interesting observations about this. So that's really exciting when you bring people together just to critically analyze these, these, these bullet points. And another thing that I'd like to bring up here is that, so my main passion goes around energy efficiency. So the, most of the course will, is about energy efficiency in software, but we also focus on other aspects of sustainability. Individual sustainability, as in how to uh, make sure that your software organization is actually helping developers or all the stakeholders be more productive and satisfied with the work environment. So we call it individual sustainability and the social sustainability, how your software is affecting democracy or how is it affecting the well-being of individuals in the, soci in the society. And these kind of things are also also bring very interesting questions that not always have clear or 
not not always everyone is on the same page. For example, I can bring up the concept of inclusive programming language. That sometimes it's very difficult for some students to understand some some of the guidelines that we have to make sure that this particular software is inclusive. So there's one thing that you spoke about was this, as I understand it, there's an issue about units, like what am I using? Because you mentioned words like power and energy, for example. So that was one thing that you mentioned that was something that students struggle with. And then this thing about like inclusive programming, is that like how easy it might be to learn in terms of how many concepts you need to have in your head? Something like Python or by comparison to like say C++, which has a lot more features in a language, for example. Is it that kind of thing? No, when we, when we talk about inclusiveness, it's more about some keywords that you might have in your code that might have a meaning in our society that, that might be not so inclusive. Yeah? For example, there are some guidelines around the inclusive language that recommend you not to use dummy variables, for example. Mm. Like a dummy variable is something that every coder learns uh, to use uh, since the, the first stages because uh, sometimes you need to have a dummy variable. And this is like foo, bar, baz, that kind of stuff? Yeah. And when you say dummy, okay, got it. And, 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 and this dummy, some guidelines say hmm, you, you, might be, you might want to use a different word here that, that doesn't denote that someone is silly or these kind of things or that someone doesn't uh, is not mentally well so maybe you want to use just like I, I don't remember the replacement but there is a dictionary with a few uh, new replacements for all these variables and usually this is this is so new for everyone that if you look at the code no one is following these practices but every single part of this let's call it dictionary has a meaning behind it that it's not immediate for us because we are kind of privileged and that we, we don't need to worry about this or we, we never suffer from, from the usage of these names in society, but they, they will actually affect someone. And, and that's why many organizations are starting to bring this up. I think this is really interesting because I've I remember being to the NDC conference, the conference here in Oslo. It was remote because it was 2020, I believe. And it was a, a keynote about the same concept. And I hadn't thought about a lot of these concepts otherwise. But things like, why is it called a whitelist and a blacklist when we really mean an allow list and a blocked list? Those words are actually more descriptive, but it's through tradition we've used other words. For example, if you mean a primary and a secondary data source, why would you use terminology like master slave? Because really what you mean is primary and secondary. They're, they better explain the scenario and they're also more inclusive. But I think that's a learning curve for, for a lot of people, no matter your, your age or experience level in the field. Yeah, I, I agree. This is something that you, you'll see in loads of code bases, kind of quote unquote in the wild as well. And like uh, you do see some organizations, some large projects actually starting to adopt this kind of stuff. But on the subject of particular kind of like terminology, you said one or two really interesting things there, Luis. You spoke about the idea of, okay, there's efficiency, but there's also like the individual sustainability and also the impact that you might have on the outside world. And I suppose internally we have... I mean, when recently I was on a panel recently and one discussion was basically about this distinction between, say, green IT and green software and IT for sustainability. Like this idea that these are two separate concepts which may be related, but they're different from each other. And a lot of the time it's very easy to see these ideas being conflated a lot. And I wonder if this is something that you've seen, you've seen on the course or if you've, or this is something students have been able to kind of pick up quite intuitively, for example. Well... To be honest, I don't know the answer because on the first class, I made sure that we all have a, a common definition. Ah. But I could imagine that some of my students were expecting something else when they joined the course. Yeah? Because indeed, there are so many different names around sustainability, about around the green software. And when I mentioned green AI, people immediately think about AI for energy efficiency or AI for social good. And when I talk about green AI, and I'm not saying that I have the right definition, <laughs> because there are so many definitions that it's difficult to keep up with the right ones. But when I talk about green AI, I immediately think about 
building AI systems that are energy efficient and they have minimal footprint in our environment. So, but, but I'm not claiming that I have the right definition because this is so new. I mean, the first paper on green AI is like three or four years old. And I don't think we are already at the stage where we can say that our, mature, our field is mature and that we can already settle down these definitions because maybe next year a new problem will bring will, uh, will, uh, will be uh, uh, brought into the picture and we need another definition and then suddenly we need to uh, re rethink about this. And indeed, as you were saying, this, this can be quite not only counterintuitive, but confusing. And, and the simple fact that when we talk about sustainable software engineering, uh, different people might have different definitions. And I'm going to challenge that definition a little bit. So some definitions, when we talk about sustainable software engineering, also include economical sustainability and technical sustainability. And of course, we... We don't care about the economical sustainability. Everyone is uh, taking care of that. That's how the, the, the world runs. And we don't care about technical sustainability because the software engineering field is already quite mature for, for 60 years. We have been studying technical sustainability for software. But just to give you an idea that this doesn't make our life easier, but the good thing is that once we start getting our hands dirty, once we start measuring energy consumption and uh, start extracting knowledge out of these uh, data and experiments, definitions are just a way of communicating it. But what we need is groundwork. People like-minded that are willing to create new tools, do new experiments, things like what is the most energy efficient video call platform? Is it Zoom? Is it Microsoft Teams? No one knows. No, no one knows. But if I knew, I would start doing all my calls with a particular system because I'll know that although there is an impact, they are actually worrying about it and they are actually trying to 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 do something about it. So they they deserve having more users. Yeah, and I think that's an interesting point as well. If you think about students, and, and I can only speak from my own experience as a, I'm going to self-proclaim as a young person, as a millennial or a selenial is a new word I've learned, which is the people between millennial and Gen Z. I don't know, maybe that's where I fall in. Anyway, I think my generation grew up more with climate awareness. There was never a grace period in our life where we were not aware of climate change or where we did not feel the effects Oh, climate change. I cannot remember a time in my life where I was told because I've always known, sort of, because I was, I, I, I suppose I was told at some point, but I was too young to remember that now. So there is an increased desire, I think, to, to lean in and to be part of the solution. I think an easier way for people is, is to use you say you become a software engineer because that's your passion or, or a like researcher in the field, but you still want to do something to help. And then applying technology to a climate problem seems like the easiest thing you can do. Like, yes, I love AI. I want to use it for good. And that's great. And like, we're not saying stop doing that. But I think when you flip it on the end and say, okay, but if the way you're doing this is actually unsustainable, it's kind of maybe not counterintuitive, but not really meeting what you're trying to do. And I've been speaking a lot externally, specifically about machine learning and AI. And almost every time I get people afterward who are almost frustrated, like, but I want to know what I can do. And it's like, yeah, but I, I told you a bunch of things you can do. No, but I don't want to. I just want to do my normal stuff, like code away and then like contribute to something good. And I think it's a mind, mind shift that needs to happen. And you can definitely do both. But I think we also need a bit of marketing for like this, what you said, Louis, about building these libraries, doing these case studies, doing the groundwork to figure out, because it's still very new. But that doesn't mean there are no opportunities and no chances for people to contribute. There, On the opposite, there are tons of chances for people to contribute and, and make a, a big, significant contribution and difference to, to this field. So this is actually maybe a good time to 
plug for people who've never heard this, who haven't ha haven't listened to previous episodes. Some of the work we did when we looked at AI, green, green, green AI and AI for sustainability a couple of issues ago. In that, we had both um, Dr. Linkak, sorry, Professor Linkak, talking about basically AI for sustainability and uh, some of the specific applications you could actually see in use and also where some of the blind spots might be when it comes to regulators. But the nice thing was that there was a paper that, that, sh that, that she'd mentioned, but also one of the other people on the other guests uh, Will, I've totally forgot Will's name, but his paper was actually published specifically like iterating through all these techniques you can actually use for it. So if you look through the previous episodes and the show notes, you'll see the paper which literally says these are some of the techniques you're using. So if you're using technique A, here's how to, here's how to use technique B for almost the same impact or these are the trade-offs you might actually have. And I, Sarah, I, I kind of want to ask you a little bit about some of the study, some of the work that you studied on this, because as I understand it, you were doing a bit of work with consensus mechanisms. I don't want to let, let's not dive too deep, deeply into the world of, of <laughs> cryptocurrencies <Yes>. and, and <laughs> greening cryptocurrencies, because no, no, no. to an extent, it feels like the price of the falling price is sorting some of that out for us anyway. But there is a whole thing like you you did some work comparing, I think, some tools around this, like a like Hyperledger. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So back, this was my master thesis, actually, which was later turned into a paper. And at the time, blockchain technology, I'm not, I'm going to refer to it as blockchain technology and sort of remove the economics from it, because you can view it as an economic structure, or you can view it as a data structure. And for this talk, we're going to look at it as a data structure, because that allows us more freedom <laughs> in some sense. So at the time, blockchain technology was really new. There were very, very few studies. And to the best of our knowledge, the study I did was the first study where we actually compared blockchain technology to distributed databases. Because especially for permission blockchains, so where you where you have trust, they can achieve a lot of the same use cases. And it can be interesting for you as a practitioner to know when you should select one or the other. Because in theory, in my mind, a blockchain is kind of like an append-only data structure. And that sounded interesting to uh, to investigate more because it's very different from a traditional distributed database, even though they can do some things very similarly. So I looked specifically at Hyperledger Fabric, which was still kind of new at the time, and at Cassandra, who, who was a bit older <laughs> at the time, and did a, a performance comparison. Because performance is, is one aspect. You can, like sustainability is very multifaceted. And when you have a master thesis, you kind of have a limited time, so you can't delve into all the things. Uh, but yeah, that was that was the work that I did. So Cassandra, a distributed kind of key value store, essentially, and a Hyperledger, which I I, I can't even begin to understand how uh, or or talk confidently about hype about her the internals of Hyperledger. But I do know, like since that's been published, there's actually been quite a lot of interesting work moving on from just looking at kind of key value stores like Cassandra, for example. I know that Cassandra is mostly written in Java, is it? Is it not? I th it's primarily on the JVM, right? I think so, yes. Yeah, I know that there is, there's essentially one a kind of technique that I've seen relatively new, which I'm, I think I'm borrowing a term that IBM coined about a decade ago called scale in which I think is really interesting because it's essentially creating a API compatible implementation of an existing piece of software that is much, much more efficient in many cases. So the canonical example would be, say, ScyllaDB. It's written in a very particular kind of C++. It uses like a shared nothing kind of architecture that basically means that it's API compatible, but quite a bit faster. And, and, and as a result, you're able to kind of run the same workloads on a, on a fraction of the kind of resources. And this is one thing that I've seen. And I'd be really curious about seeing some of that, well, seeing that study rerun again, because you see that you, this is a pattern that I've seen once. And uh, I think there are actually other examples. If you do stuff with SQLite these days, there's one called DuckDB, which essentially lets you do the kind of large scale or well, medium data analytics these days, but onto something which is running in a single process. There's a bunch of really interesting stuff in this field right now, actually. Yeah, and, and I think what, what you said there in the middle was the sort of key. I think performance might not be an immediate connection to sustainability and green software, but the, the packed tighter is, is the keyword here. Because if you use fewer CPU cycles, well, you have more free, quote unquote, CPU cycles to use for other things. That means you can use less resources. So that's why read, write efficiency is very important. That's also when we look at machine learning, for example, the training 
time. So the latency you have for that is a very interesting factor for sustainability. And there's been papers published on this to support. It's just not my opinion, other smarter people's opinions as well. All right. I'm glad you mentioned the papers thing because, Luis, this is actually one thing that I was going to, I wanted to ask you about the course. So we spoke mostly about energy efficiency so far as one or resource efficiency, but like, you know, hardware usage, for example. Do, how, have students have had, had much luck understanding one of the other pillars, the idea of like carbon efficiency or being able to change the intensity of the resources you might use? Because this is one thing that is relatively new and it's something we've spoken about and where you can use some tools for this, like what time, for example, to see how green the energy might be. And I want to name check a couple of papers which have been doing some really, really cool stuff in this. But I figured it might be ask, worth asking you how students respond to this part here or if that even shows up in the course. Yeah, so uh, I, I was not very long on the when I talked about units, but we have a, a, a single class dedicated to units on energy efficiency. And we start with energy consumption, of course, power consumption, but then we go all the way to, to the data center level in which we mm, no longer think only about energy efficiency, but we also need to think about the carbon footprint, carbon intensity, carbon consumption. What does it mean to be carbon efficient? I mean, what is exactly carbon, right? It's not only about CO2, it's also about all the other CO2 equivalent cases. And, and this this kind of thing is not clear to everyone. Even to me, sometimes I need to go back to the uh, my documentation and check whether I get the definitions right. So, so one class is fully dedicated to it. But one cool thing is after after this class, I think most students got it right, if not everyone. So, so one part of the course is you need to come up with a project that revolves around the tool that will help software engineers build energy efficient software or sustainable software, let's say. And one of the projects that was developed by one of the groups was a scheduler of software tasks that will take into account the carbon footprint or the carbon intensity of the grid. So that means that you, when you're scheduling a task, you can say, this task takes two hours, but I don't mind waiting 10 hours to get the result. And then based on this, the scheduler would check what would be the best time to run this task. And this is a very simple idea that is based on a paper from Google, if I'm not mistaken, where they have carbon aware data centers in which they basically decide when a particular task can be run or not. But they have a very complex setup. And these students thought, okay, that's a really cool idea. It works for large organizations, but why not give these, the power of this idea to just the ordinary software developer that, that also wants to do something around these lines? So they created a very basic tool. I can share the link to it. It's a prototype, of course, because they only had four weeks to develop it. But you, you basically just define what is the common that you want to execute, what is your uh, time constraints, and there you go. We have a carbon efficient uh, execution. And I find it quite cool. Uh, another thing, if you if you allow me, Chris, and si si since we mentioned uh, blockchain and energy efficiency in the same paragraph, and you usually get a lot of people angry about it, regardless of the, uh, the idea or opinion we have about it, I just wanted to say that although I'm not against blockchain, I, I think we, we need blockchain, but that also means that we need energy efficiency in blockchain. So we, we need energy efficiency and blockchain in the same paragraph more often, and we need to have constructive conversations. So we, we need everyone, even the ones that are uh, getting rich with bitcoins. We need all these people to, 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 to think about how to solve this problem, because this is a real problem. And, uh, and I'm going to stop here. I don't want angry people around there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well... There's one thing that you've actually pointed to, or one thing you've mentioned. I mean, if with your position as a professor and being able to like have some influence on new developers and new sort of new engineers, I'll happily let you give you that platform to like say that yeah, you should probably be caring about that because yeah, I mean, this is actually one thing we were talking about before, Sarah. You mentioned one of the reasons you chose to study what you studied on your masters was because there was some influence from one of your professors, and they kind of like 
gave you some of the space to even think about this stuff. Um, maybe you might would like explain that because that was a really nice story, I thought. Yeah, absolutely. And I touched briefly on it in, in earlier as well, but this green IT course that I was able to take in my fourth year, actually, it, it really opened my eyes also to this concept of the duality of it. Like we've talked about in this podcast, not only that you can use software for good purposes, but the software itself actually comes from somewhere. And, and data centers are huge. When you, If you've never been to a data center, it's kind of hard to phantom. Like they're very fussy in like concept, at least to me, like if you come from a kind of normal non-data science background as a kid, which most kids do. Field trips to data centers aren't that common yet. Then it can be hard to understand just how big this impact can be. Around the time I took this course, it was at the time relatively new paper, now slightly older paper that compared the carbon footprint of the ICT sector and placed it at 2%, which was the same as aviation. And that's a number I still see quoted over and over and over again, because it's so impactful, because we talk a lot about aviation, but we talk less, but now more about this. So yes, Simin, who was the professor of that course, and Mikael Asplund, who is uh, another big influence from the Linköping University in Sweden. They were my supervisor and, oh, I don't know the English word for it. Whoever approves your master thesis <laughs> person. <laughs> Maybe promoter? Um, yeah, possibly that's the word. I'll, I'll, take, I'll trust you. Yeah, to give me the space to, to explore this deeper. And, and they have done more research on energy efficiency later as well. And I think it it is so important to have that influence when you are sort of malleable. I guess you never stop being malleable, but you're truly malleable at university. So I am forever grateful to having had that opportunity so early. And actually my university enforces you. Everyone has to take one course that has a sustainability topic. You cannot graduate until you've done that, which also I think is a good way because there are like, for some reason, some political tied into this, which I Personally, I think it's unnecessary, but there are for some people, but this is a good way to make sure everyone at least gets a baseline of knowledge. All right, so we're coming up to the last, like, say, few minutes of the episode. So I figured while we're talking about some of the people whose work that's actually who you'd recommend or, or point people to, and we'll add, is it Simin uh, Najim Tara? I need you to pronounce it one more time because I'm not very good at that name. I'm sorry. Simin Najam Tehrani. Okay, we'll make sure that's definitely in the show notes because that's there's something that's definitely worth looking at. While we're here, um, Lewis, is there any are there any people you'd recommend or you think is whose work you'd suggest people look up? Because there's a couple of names that I've found really interesting of late, and I figure this might be a nice way to kind of wrap up with a top, topic of pedagogy and learning from existing state of the art, for example. Yeah, I, I can on top of my head, I can think of two rock stars. One is Elena Eriksson. Uh, she's an associate professor at KTH. She has been awarded a number of times for her work on education of sustainable software, sustainable ICT in the universities. And of course, Patricia Vago from VU Amsterdam. She's one of the first researchers in green software in our software engineering community community. So if you want to have an interesting landscape of or, or, or a role model for research and education on sustainable software engineering, they are definitely uh, worth uh, following. All right. I'll add a couple because just recently there was a series of conferences. The ACM had a conference specifically about energy and there was one paper which was co-authored. I think Colleen Josephson was the uh, one of the lead authors. She did some really interesting stuff about this whole idea about, like your student mentioned, about moving basically uh, time-shifting compute in various places. That was one thing that I found really fascinating and that was actually... Actually, talking about okay, she works at VMware. These are the numbers that we've sat, we've seen, and been able to use. And here's how we're actually able to productionize some of this stuff. And the other work that I think is really interesting. I'm probably going to uh, mispronounce her name as well, and I'm so sorry uh, for the author. I think it's Bil Bilge Achun or Essen. Um, there was a work called Carbon Explorer, which is both online on GitHub and is also a really fascinating paper that was also presented at that conference, which. I think it's considered as like one of the state-of-the-art things here, actually. I found it really, really worth looking through because, once again, this was someone who's worked, doing some work at Facebook, looking at the ways that they're able to achieve the targets of 
carbon reduction year on year going through this. And they both looked at the load shifting part. They looked at using mixing in renewables. And they actually put together a solver to for each, each every single data center, talk about what the optimal mix was for each of these. I've never seen that work before. And it's really, really worth looking. And I've, when I looked up her work, there's like just so much there to look at. And it's so nice seeing that stuff in the open. Sarah, I want to give you kind of the last the last word on this because I'm sure there's some other people who you've, who've actually found interesting or whose work you're, I don't know, a fan of or you, you, you direct people's eyes to, I suppose. Absolutely. Sabine Kandit, she recently wrote a book. It's in German, so sadly I can't uh, read it, but, but I've had the synopsis explained to me. And she, she talked to me about the book. I was interviewed also for it. Hannah Smith is another great educator who's involved in climate action tech and Green Tech Southwest, I believe, is the community. And also uh, Sandra Palinger from, from Microsoft, who's also involved in uh, climate action tech, who I really enjoy. I didn't know that you were going to mention Hannah, but uh, the thing I need to say is that Hannah recently joined uh, the organization I work at called the Green Web Foundation, and she's now heading up all the training. So I'm, I'm really glad, happy to hear that you've mentioned that because, yeah, she's working on a bunch of that stuff. So in, if this is interesting to anyone who's listening, then, well, I guess there's a plug. Louise, I feel a bit embarrassed about talking about our own organization here. So I'm probably going to try and leave the last word with you about this because you've mentioned this course. If people do want to find out more about this work that you're doing or some of the other output that you're, you'd like to kind of people to look at, is there a particular website or is there a space you'd share? Because we'll share the link to the, 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 the engineering course, but there may be other things that you want to draw people's attention to, for example. Yeah, I mean, definitely, if you want to have a quick start on sustainable software engineering, please do share the link at the end of the podcast. I'm not going to say it out loud, but please do check it. I also write frequently, so if you check my personal website, I have a blog where I try to write the same content of the course, but in a way that is more friendly for the internet readers. So I try to write it in the form of blog posts. So if if you want to reach out, of course, you can also follow me on Twitter, Luis M. Cruz, and I'm more than happy to interact with and to, to hear any thoughts or any feedback about the course. If there are more ideas that are more content that I should add, please let me know. And I'm, I'm making this request not only to Sarah and Chris, but to anyone out there, because I think this is how we can evolve and how we can change our software industry. Cool. Thank you, Luis. Well, I think that's taken us up to the time we have left available. Sarah, Luis, thank you so much for joining. Yep. Yeah, have a lovely evening or morning wherever you are in the world. Okay. Take care. Hey, everyone. Thanks for listening. Just a reminder to follow Environment Variables on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. And please do leave a rating and review if you like what we're doing. It helps other people discover the show. And of course, we'd love to have more listeners. To find out more about the Green Software Foundation, please visit greensoftware.foundation. That's greensoftware.foundation in any browser. Thanks again and see you in the next episode.